more of a mediator, but today I'm gonna I'm gonna focus. I'm gonna go for moderation. So it's a it's a massive privilege to be able to introduce these three people. Uh, the first person I'm gonna introduce is a builder who has uh, been a veteran. He is active in um, adoption areas, and he is really just a uh, he's a expert in the field of creative construction and he has a business for housing solutions. I want to welcome Andrew Bennett to the stage. Andrew, come on out. Okay, the next person on our distinguished panel that I'm going to bring out is um, a woman from Phoenix, Arizona, who is doing amazing things using tiny homes to help homeless veterans in her community. She's not only about veterans, she's about all sorts of other different programs, and she's got multiple tiny home villages that she's created. And her organization is not just an organization, but it's also, it, she's a developer. So there's a non-profit arm, and then there's also a for-profit arm of what she does. May I please introduce you to Elizabeth Singleton. She's the director of... So yeah, I, if you didn't hear that over the applause, her organization is called Build Us Hope, and they're doing great things. Okay, the final panelist, the distinguished, I'm going to tell you about her. She has been probably in more tiny homes and has met and experienced more people who have lived in tiny homes uh, than any other person on the planet. With the help of her partner, Christian, they travel the country and they expose the stories of people that are living in tiny homes and how they've done it, what they would have done better and they work towards spreading awareness and education so that we can break down policies that keep this industry from moving forward. May I please bring to stage Alexis Stevens. And if you want to know more about Alexis Stevens, she has a website and social media following at Tiny House Expeditions. Guys, thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for being here, everybody. So I'm gonna, I want to first start out and I'm going to ask people about what it is that they do. And we're just going to get something off the bat. Real quick answer. What is a tiny house, Andrew? Um, I mean, to me, a tiny house is a obviously a small structure, being tiny. Um, and for, for me, I also like to think of it mostly as a mobile structure, a movable structure. Um, obviously, you can do tiny houses on foundations forever. We've done forever. And uh, so really what I want to focus on here is um, acknowledging the um, feasibility of a tiny house that is movable, be it on wheels or brought in on a, on a flatbed or however they're, they're set up. Um, and I think that's really as important as the actual square footage size. Um, you know, if we're going to be 400 square feet or over, we're going to be able to yeah. and fit in the HUD. Uh, you know, we want to be under that. Uh, just for those reasons. When I first learned about tiny homes, I thought that it, what a tiny home was on a trailer. Because when I first saw things that people called tiny homes, they all were on trailers. And that was a significance because it was something brand new. And I do feel like when they got put on the trailers is what triggered people to have to start using a new name. They could just call them, oh, it's a cottage or it's a cabin. Um, so I definitely will back you on that, that there does need to be some kind of distinction. Elizabeth, can you tell me what is your idea of a tiny house? Is there a definition? Is it square footage? Is Does, all of it, does any of that matter? Uh, I'm thinking a tiny house is a residential dwelling unit. It's my home. That's all it is. That's all it is. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask the same question to Alexis. Well, in my view, a tiny house is a dwelling that's under 400 square feet, as Andrew pointed out, and it can be built to international residential code standards or a hybrid with ANSI, which is used for RVs. But typically, when you say tiny house, it's movable. And the question I always like to ask people is why wheels, right? Because it seems like, well, why don't you just put it on a foundation? But there's a lot of value to something that can be moved. 
um, for the homeowner, it's an affordable way to relocate for big life changes that really meets our fast-paced world that we live in today. And, you know, unlike other manufactured housing, it's a lot more cost prohibitive and a lot more difficult. But this can be done relatively easily. And here's the fun fact is most tiny house dwellers only move one to three times ever because they are just moving so they can be a better caregiver for family members or for a new job or something like that. So these aren't moving just to move. And if you follow me, you know, we move all the time with our tiny house, but we're weird. So. More miles than anybody else in the tiny house, right? Yep. yep. <laughs> so I think that what we're getting on here is that we're going to make a distinction when we start talking about tiny houses. We're just going to take a second and distinguish between tiny house on a foundation and tiny house on, on wheels because there is a need for that distinction because they're not treated equally under the eyes of the law. So, so it's not me docking. I want to hear, I mentioned about Andrew Bennett and how, how his um, company, Core Housing Solution, is developing new technologies that are going to make housing more attainable for more people. And what I want to hear about is your, in brief, what your scope and your mission for your business is. Okay, so I've been, been building, as you know, for about nine years now, tiny houses, and of course done the ones with you on TV, the big elaborate fancy ones. But my passion really is to make something that's truly affordable, not just to purchase, but to own your cost of living in that, in that unit. And so what my focus has been, typically, mostly for the last year, directly on this, has been our unit that we haven't displayed over there. So what our goal is to make something that's, um, we're about half the average price of a tiny house now. But also, more importantly, once you're in there, I wanted something that folks aren't being eaten to death, and they will die to death just to maintain. You know, so all of our components and appliances and that are in the house are all off the shelf stuff. You know, they're from your local hardware store, they're from your department store, the things you can replace very easily. Um, and then also the things like um, the siding. We're using a really high-tech structure system, as you know, um, it was developed by a NASA engineer, uh, literally for space station use, right? So our house is extremely light. The money you save on just your truck alone, the floor will pay for the house. Um, and also the outside of the house, so you never have to pay for the generations. So your maintenance is, is excellent. So the homes that basically are Andrew's building are, he's, in my mind, he's really trying to scientifically experiment with how low of cost that he can get the homes in terms of the construction technique without jeopardizing certain specific quality mandates, really, in terms of the insulation value, um, the quality of having a complete the uh, functioning home of having all of the, the necessities there, but then keeping the price down. And in my mind, that's that's very much a, a service to society to experiment with what we can do because that's providing a tool that's going to help people change their lives. So um, Elizabeth is in a different capacity. She's not. She doesn't have a business. She she runs a nonprofit that works for uh, homeless veterans and veterans and. It's probably even a lot more in depth than that. I know that her, her scope is bigger than just to create a village. And I just want to hear what your dream for your own for your own work is. Well, we actually our nonprofit also has a for profit that builds for the public and our proceeds go to um, a portion of our proceeds go to our nonprofit. Our focus is more on policy changes. So we started three years ago building a tiny house community. We came to the city with our big dreams of having, you know, take the 60 acres and building our 800, you know, tiny homes. And they said, no way, no tiny homes. So we broke it down to just a small lot of homes. Um, and in that small lot of homes, it just it took us over two years. And just getting through zoning, the codes, the ch different changes in structure sizes, windows, um, you name it, because they had no policies, you know, since the 60s on something under 500 square feet. So our goal was that 
instead of us going through processes like that, and other people have to go to process like that, we were going to look at a policy change nationwide, but in our state as well. So in working with building these multiple communities that you know we see, we hope to in the next few years we'll have over a thousand uh, tiny homes in different communities. We wanted to make sure that it was easier for you or anyone else to be able to go out and it wouldn't cost them if they were going to spend, you know, twenty or thirty thousand dollars, you know, to fifty thousand on a quality home, that they didn't also have another burden of zoning, permitting codes that were com conflicting and costly that the tiny house wasn't affordable. So we've been working with HUD and we've been working with our state levels. So after those two, three years, we are now having our state come up with a full policy that is will be zoned for tiny homes. And we're working with HUD to come up with policies that FHA financing will be available for platforms under 400 square feet since they don't have a requirement on size. So I'm focus on a policy change so it helps all of you be able to do it in the future. Yes. Yeah. So it's, inter it's interesting because Andrew here is building kind of this new technology and experimenting as a builder of that kind of product, how he can deliver a, a better product at a lower cost. Elizabeth is over there in, in Phoenix and she's building communities of veterans, but when I asked her what her, uh, what her goal is, she says to make it more available for everybody else out here, right? And now Alexis is very interesting because Alexis and her partner Christian have produced two films called Live in Tiny Legally. Live in Tiny Legally 1 and Live in Tiny Legally 2. So I didn't really explain that completely. Alexis isn't just an encyclopedia of tiny house history. Alexis is also a very big um, activist. First I just want to point out, you saw the tiny house at the very beginning of that video. That is my personal home that my dear partner built, I helped. Um, <laughs> so we, like Elizabeth, we wanted something for ourselves, but we were inspired to, to do something to help other people. And basically, I was inspired as I was researching to own my own home and to simplify. This is the first home I've ever owned. There's like all these amazing ways that tiny houses are being used to meet community needs around the country. And I just thought, we have to go document what people are doing and the way they're living. And as you're gonna see in this video, there's people of all ages, all backgrounds, who are drawn to tiny living, which is remarkable. And one of my favorite things about that is, it is apolitical. <laughs> you know, yeah. people, it doesn't matter what your political affiliation is, everyone can appreciate affordable housing, everyone can appreciate a high quality of life. And a tiny house represents that. Um, there's, there's mine again. Like we said, we're the weirdos who travel, but we travel with the purpose of documentation. And so what we've learned is that more people than ever, like rap I mean, we're a very small percentage of the greater population, but rapidly um, growing is the number of people who want to live in a tiny home that's well designed because they discover, guess what? I can live comfortably this way to meet my needs and I'm gonna have a higher quality of life because the savings I get, I can use towards healthcare, I can use towards groceries, or something fancy like a savings account, you know? Right. <laughs> um, but I think there's so much power to that. And also, just to point out two more things, there's more people than ever who are living alone, more people than ever who are retiring that only have a fixed income to rely on. So a tiny home could be a really good solution for those people, and those are two markets within the within the movement. Um, thirdly, I want to call out the way they can be used for low-cost, rapid emergency housing and shelter, which is happening right now. I had the great pleasure of connecting with some people this past week who are building tiny homes for campfire survivors, and they're building them in a way where all donations, under $10,000, they just delivered their two. And yes, we can say tiny homes aren't for everyone, but they have 400 people on their waiting list who need homes. And as fast as they get those donations in, they're, they're building houses. So, but the big thing is, is keeping more people from doing it is um, the legalities, the restrictive legalities. And this is really restrictive building standards, um, minimum square footage standards. I spoke to a woman this week, she says, my town says I can't 
build under 900 square feet? Well, that's not because of safety. That's just because they probably don't even know why and they need to revisit it. It probably has a lot to do with property values. Yes. But um, one last thing on that is the way they're, um, so with Living Tight Illegally, what we did is we're like, we went into planning commission meetings, city council meetings, and um, saw how grassroots advocates and policymakers were working together to overcome those obstacles through innovative zoning. And it's happening across the whole country. We have a gazillion municipalities, and that's the real challenge because it's one at a time. And there's things that we'll get into later that can help speed that up drastically, like statewide legislation. Um, but what's impressive is that when there's a will, um, you can make these changes quickly. And what's so exciting about this legislation that we've showed in our films is you can copy and paste it for other municipalities everywhere. So it takes out a lot of the work for other people. Look, here's precedent. Let's do it. There's a will. Here's a way. So that's, that's something that's been happening, and we're going to get right into that. But that there's been all of these discussions and all of these zoning codes that have been the result of long discussions between city councils, and they're all being done independently. And there's no conversation on a more large, unified capacity that could expedite those local conversations. Um, so that's a really important thing. But it doesn't mean that things aren't happening, that things aren't moving forward. So that, the question that I have... Do you feel that the Tiny House Appendix Q has started a conversation for tiny homes on a national level? Uh, I think Appendix Q, it did, but like we said, Appendix Q, for those who don't know, was in it, um, it, it was an amendment to the IRC building code that got put through uh, in 2016. And basically what it was trying to do was create some exempt exemptions, or exemptions for certain things that um, are demanded in the building code if you're building in a small capacity. And the, the, the quick answer to that is I think it has, but the real movement in tiny homes has never necessarily been on the foundations. The real push is has been typically on the portable tiny homes and the anything on wheels or anything that's manufactured and then delivered is not covered by the by the IRC Appendix Q. And a quick um, note on that, and I think we'll get into this more, but I just want to say there are currently two planned unit development examples, one in Texas and Colorado, where they've used the appendix standard. They're saying you gotta build this tiny house to code and you can use the appendix for those exceptions. And we're going to embrace alternative means and methods to allow you to tie down this movable structure because we recognize the trailer as an alternative foundation. So that's really interesting. Oh. Well, they're definitely one-off situations, and the permitting hasn't played out. So I think we're going to see over the next year how feasible or not that is. I want to divide it back up a little bit. And I just want us to take each person's goal and their own project and identify what your major blocks because we've identified the dreams of, for your for your business but but what are the major roadblocks keeping you from being able to implement on a on a wider scale and um you can take it yeah. andrew and yeah pass it well i mean i'll, I'll start kind of going the ball but uh, you know we mentioned the appendix q and and we've seen that it obviously is starting to maybe do some things but but what, what I've seen happen in my own personal experience trying to get permits and things like that for our homes, uh, like I have a house I set up a mile and a half from here, where we are right now, fully permitted, uh, tied into the grid, it's on somebody's property behind their house with a zero lot clearance, no problem. I've tried to put one in my own yard, I can't do it. And so there may be um, uh, state legislation that they pass or local municipalities, but I think that, you know, I think you mentioned we need a national uh, acceptance of this. We need something that's going to be from the top and then give the local municipalities uh, an incentive and empowerment to say, yeah, we can do that. Even my own local municipality, and the last one I tried to do said, oh yeah, they're allowed to do those everywhere now. And I was like, great. And so I go to do it and they're like, oh yeah, you can't do it here. <laughs> well, why? Well, because we're not allowed. Well, why? You know, and I'm the, I'm the why guy, right? I drop nuts. Um, so what I, what I, 
can't stand is that, you know, but I can do it over here. How come I can't do it over here? And all my friends have tiny houses. Why can't I? Um, and I think that, you know, I've worked so hard on making a solution. My pe we, all, we all have a piece of the puzzle, right? And if we can get everybody to bring their piece of the puzzle, it's going to be a beautiful picture. And I think that we're just now starting to get the, some of the major pieces in place, HUD being one, and really hats off to HUD for even being open to, let alone initiating. Right? Yes, yes, yes. Oh my gosh, when I got involved, I was like, whatever it's gonna take, I'm, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do everything I possibly can, and it, and it was a push. Um, so I've got my piece of the puzzle. I've got the part, you know, our house meets uh, the, the code for 33,000 different municipalities, mm -hmm. right? And we haven't been inspected. So as you mentioned, it was a regulation, some sort of standard that we can go by. We're not making this stuff up. We're like, let's take everything they could possibly ask us to do and just do it. You know, that way if somebody says, well, it has to be meet this code, like, okay, here you go. We'll look at it. Let's see what it does. Yeah, and, and I think it's one important note to make is that when we're talking about a universal building code, the inclusion of individuals like Andrew who has such a non-traditional construction style is really important because if we go about creating this designation for this industry, but then that designation is so limited and rigid that we're, yeah. we're taking away our opportunity to utilize that te technology, then we're really moving backwards when we should be moving in the other direction and, and crafting exemptions that are intended on facilitating new concepts and new technology to be utilized within that structure. Yeah, it can't be a stifling regulation. It has to be one that, that embraces and encourages and incentivizes this type of study. I think I put it in on some notes yesterday we were talking about. Was here's a, here's a way for people like us who are really trying to be innovative with these ideas. Is if you think about it, if I'm going to experiment with a building uh, structure type, um, if I get to do it on a one tenth scale, it costs one tenth the price, you know, roughly, right? So as a as a, an engineer and a creative guy, it's great if I get to do it on a tiny house platform. Yeah. And even greater if I can put it on wheels and take it around and show everybody, right? So you guys get to see it. So I get to use my creativity, I get to use these new, um, you know, high performance materials and building methods. And it didn't cost, it, I didn't have to go through all my kids' savings and my own to make something to present to the world. I was able to do it on a one tenth scale. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to throw the same question over to Elizabeth, but I'm going to preface it first because Elizabeth. She does a lot of different work, but it started with working for homeless veterans, okay? We all support the heroes of our country, right? We're all behind the veterans. It's a national yes. disgrace in my mind. It's, yeah, it's something that we all are supportive of. And here we have a woman who's got a beautiful vision, who's got all the organization one could vote for, who's got momentum and is changing people's lives, and she's doing it for homeless veterans. And she's still running into huge opposition. And I would like to, for you to kind of talk about that process. Um, what were the barriers to entry in the beginning? Have you been able to open awareness of of what it is that you're doing and break down some of the resistance, or is that resistance as entrenched as ever? Well, um, I, I think the barrier is this, is that a lot of those who were in my planning and zoning department did not know their own codes, and so, and their codes um, didn't uh, reflect the size square footage of homes we were trying to build, which our first tiny house community uh, for veterans were 288 square foot uh, homes. And um, there were bathrooms, you had your own private bedroom, and then kitchen living area, and uh, they're beautiful homes made out of light um, gauge steel um, paneling systems, which were injected with graphite uh, private diary, and so they were completely insulated. They we worked with ASU um, and Greenlight Solutions, who are um, student-based, uh, looking at sustainability all the way across. So we had to get rid of our gray water system. We had to get rid of our solar systems. We had to get rid of everything that made it really sustainable because they had no one policy. 
about that and every one of those, especially in this square footage, would kill our, our process. And so after we go and build the design after two years, we would get, you know, we built this, but now your window's too small. So, you know, five windows later, you know, we wanted this size, this small, not looking at the square footage of this home. Um, not understanding their own policy. They wanted us to build two car garages for each tiny house. I know. And then I'm reading down their policies and says, hey, well now keep reading down where it says you only need one parking space per house under 500 square feet. So you have to know your own, you got to get to know your own zoning codes. Um, it wasn't that I had any NIMBY, NIMBY or not in my backyard, if you don't know what that is. I didn't have any resistance. Ed, resistance. We, our first town hall meeting that we had for the public, we had over 500 people show up and we only had openings for 200 people. So that's how the community was interested. But the barriers were, you know, setbacks. So we had 7,000 square feet of property where we could put four tiny homes, beautiful homes, um, and parking, but we had to, we had density setback issues, we had, you know, 20 feet here, 30 feet here, so you have a lot of wasted space that you could live, you'd be on, but then it doubled the cost. So again, when I talk about cost, they were billing us where it was, mm -hmm. as, it's 288 square feet, but as giving us permits and codes and regulations based on a thousand square foot home. And so that raised our costs and the difficulties of it. What has happened now is that we actually sat down with our zoning and planning department, our city council, and our state representatives, and we are now building a plan. So if I want to go, the whole thing is about affordability for veterans. For affordability, our veterans that we have are veterans that are actually working veterans who are sleeping in their cars. So they're called the unsheltered. They're working, but they can't afford to get off their feet, which is a class of people that are ignored. So we are focused on, on that population. But we also want to make sure that, in general, when we go out into the community, that those veterans can buy those homes one day, so the difficulties of parceling those out won't be there, and that they are seen as the same quality standards as a home that's going to last for 100 years. So it's building towards a smaller platform that confuses them the most, so they wanted to be perfect, so they were writing us, you know, made up stuff, um, because I, I think that's supposed to be there because I'm not used to that. The, how we've gotten over that is actually partnering with them and going, talking to our mayors, our city council members, our planning and zoning department, sitting down with structures and saying this is no different from a house. It's just in a smaller packet and it doesn't require all of these things. I'm going to tell you, if you're looking to plan a community, you need to get to know your own planning and zoning codes. Don't rely on your, your planner. And I'm sorry for all you planners out there. It's not against you. But you will know more than them, and you have to fight for what you want to have there. So whether it's on wheels or on foundation. Moving forward, again, is educating the public on these structures and sizes. New York, California, all, there, all these locations already have small square footage uh, uh, residential homes already. Mm -hmm. So looking at those and addressing it with our planners to say this is how we can add gray water systems or composting toilets or you know those uh, solar systems without you going into a full blown 2,000 square foot home policy. Yeah, I mean, I feel like what you're, I'm hearing from you is that you're saying that the resistance wasn't anything coming from the community, and it wasn't necessarily coming from the actual codes. It was just kind of from confusion. Correct. And, and when I kind of talked earlier about how there's these conversations that are taking up a huge amount of energy, I can only imagine how much energy was going on into having that conversation with the city, all the conversations that they had to have to figure awesome. out their own policy. Now you can multiply that amount of energy with all the different municipalities around the country that are going through the same process. And they're doing it independently without coordination and we're coming up with a little bit of different results. And to me, I just see it as another example of why 
we do need to come together and, and make some more universal um, declarations about what this is, what this kind of tiny home thing really is, so that we can avoid having all of those intense yeah. conversations that are all independent talking about the same thing. You know, and here's it's a good point to bring up too, because what happens is people like us, we we spend an exhaustive amount of time down there that we don't get paid for, right? And we have families to support. Um, so getting here, where it's like, you know, okay, you're not going to do it. I'm going to tell mom. You know, and so we're 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 here we're here to tell mom, Mama Hood. They they're not playing nice, right? So if we can get it from the from the top down to say just back off, guys, basically, um, and allow us to to be innovative and, and solve some problems. I know uh, Dr. Ben Carson had mentioned in a video I watched recently. He's like. If we would just get the regulatory um, setbacks out of the way, you know, the, the hurdles out of the way, Americans will solve their own problems. I mean, we're an innovative bunch of people, right? Yeah, and we're going to do it if we just let them do it. it. It does remind me very much of traditional kind of goals, which of deregulation, deregulating industry to allow the private sector to take over and do what the private sector does best, which is be creative and fill solutions. Well, you so that's exactly what we're housing doing. crisis. It's people can't afford what we. I mean, Americans still believe in the American dream, and we have an affordable housing crisis, and we don't have enough land space anymore. People are moving back in the homes with their family members. What tiny house homes create on wills and on foundation is a sense of I can still have that American dream and not go broke, yes. you know? Um, I don't have to live with my parents, or I may live in the backyard, but I own my own home. Um, and so when you have, are in a crisis, then you have to start thinking outside of the box, and that's what this is today. That's what all of you are here doing today, is let's think outside of the box. So how can we take small pieces of infill property and create multiple housing structures, but also allow people to freely live in their home based where, whether it's on wheels of foundation and a smaller platform, and not create such a hazard where we still have an affordable housing crisis and we still have people going on the street or we, you know, we're, we're creating a problem. And our state, we have no workforce housing. So all of our workforce extra housing people are sleeping in, in a casino parking lot. Oh, yeah. So one thing that I just, I heard there was that this, this movement it's almost bringing our codes up to date with the needs of a modern society is the way I yeah. look at it. I think the building codes were put in place for very honest reasons of trying to protect people. The zoning codes are typically, I want to believe, put in place for, for genuinely, you know, a, a, a positive intentions. Um, but the needs and the, the risks to the world were different back then, and we have new we have new risks that we need to address through climate change, through the housing crisis, and these need to be addressed as real, as real threats to us and, and built in and accommodated for that code. So, so what it really is is that we're, we have a different kind of society now, and I think that somebody who's seen that in a very in-depth capacity would be a Lexus of... So, to not just the, the new relevance of the new challenges that are on our world, the new pressures that we have, but can you speak to the new attitudes that you're seeing out there and why people are being drawn to this different, this type of home and this type of lifestyle? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, especially out of the housing crisis of 2008, that's accelerate, accelerated greatly due to new stresses and also thanks to TV shows. Um, thanks, Zach. Um, but no, really, like, people are like, oh my gosh, I can live simply and comfortably. It's like rocket science, though. We've been doing it forever. Um, and I think that's really interesting. And so for me, it's people seeing a different kind of, Ameri a different kind of American dream, one of reduced debt and greater freedom with their time. <laughs> Let me sit right here. <laughs> if you, if you bring this and kind of wrap it around in the front, I found that to work pretty good. How's this? Here we go. Um, but yeah, greater freedom of time. And when you slaving away just to meet your basics, it doesn't leave a lot of time or money for things that you need or would like to do, like, you know, spend time with loved ones. Um, something 
interesting I just read was the United Way has a study out that says 43% um, of households nationwide cannot afford to cover all the basics of what we would consider quality of life. You know, beyond housing, groceries, healthcare, transportation. 43%, that's a lot. So when you look at those numbers and then you look at, like I mentioned before, the numbers of people who are living without kids or retiring, um, you know, as living without kids younger or older, you know, you really see that the tiny home has been a real light bulb for so many people. And that's really been refreshing to see. And I know I've witnessed people touring my tiny house, like probably gonna happen this weekend, where people come in and they get blown away and you see a paradigm shift happen in the moment where they're like, oh my gosh, like you guys are happy and comfortable and you own your own home. Like maybe success is not a large home, right? Because that's just been shoved down our throats of like you're successful if you check these certain blocks. And I think a lot of people are realizing that's just a lot of baloney. Um, and you know, success is really being healthy and happy. And so I think to achieve that on a community larger scale, diverse housing to meet diverse needs. Diverse communities are healthy communities. And like uh, Elizabeth was mentioning, what's brilliant um, and kind of like a no-brainer is a tiny house on wheels, specifically right now, can create huge amounts of housing stock overnight if we had loosened, <laughs> if we didn't have to go city by city to change zoning. And ways that that can be done, or one, one of my favorites, is a tiny house as an accessory dwelling because it uses existing land, existing infrastructure. There's an opportunity for community relationship and resource sharing on a small scale from just helping the main homeowner pay their mortgage and their taxes um, to things more, you know, like childcare or whatnot. So. Can I, can I yeah. interrupt there real yeah, quick? So I, I just want to clarify what she's talking about real quick. So with a tiny house, we talked earlier about kind of categorizing them, right? So a tiny home on a foundation being just kind of a small cabin, right? Tiny homes in the way that the industry is currently operating is basically producing RVs. They're certified as RVs and they're designated to be used in RV parks. What Alexis is talking about when she says tiny homes as ADUs, an ADU is an abbreviation for accessory dwelling unit, and it basically means a, a detached dwelling unit on an existing property. And that's an important distinction, I think, and the reason that I want to say it's a distinction, uh, an important distinction is when we're talking about tiny homes and where you can park them and where you can actually implement that, we're really talking about trailer parks right now. We're talking about trailer parks, we're talking about counties that don't have regulations against living on something on wheels. And that means that if you want to live in a tiny house, your options are so slim of where you can actually put it, that it really jeopardizes the entire validity of everything that we're trying to do. So by, by making them and promoting them as accessory dwelling units, what, what she's really talking about is allowing these portable structures to be used in that capacity and not mandating them be on foundations and what that does to not only the industry like Andrew's ability to create a good product and have it have a place for it and not only for Elizabeth what it does for her well the accessory dwelling unit is a little bit different than what Elizabeth is doing but Elizabeth's about trying to make it free for everyone. Right. And so it's all kind of in this, or make it possible for everyone. And keep in mind, we're not, we're not trying to say that you shouldn't be able to just buy some property and put a home that you deem adequate. That, I mean, as Americans, I feel like that is kind of falls into someone's rights. Um, but if, if I could jump in on the accessory dwelling unit thing, I just, um, if it become like a broken record, I'm sorry, because I always want to point out what are the benefits of the, the movability point, because I think it seems like a no-brainer to do a foundation, especially if you already allow ADU, but the benefits are the lower impact and lower cost of placing that movable tiny house in a backyard as compared to the cost of laying a foundation and the permitting of a traditional ADU. And one really cool thing is I have to say, there are seven cities now across the country on both coasts 
that have ordinances that allow tiny houses as ADUs. And one that's really interesting to me is in California where it's like, instead of messing with code so much, you know, they're like, well, there's nothing exactly right, so why don't we say, let's define how a tiny house is different than an RV, but then let's, but then, uh, so by defining it as something different, they, but we're gonna use the same RV code, they um, loosen, their building department is like overloaded. So now they don't have to go to the building department for the same kind of like permitting, which can be really difficult. They've simplified it. So picturing something like that on a national or on a state scale where they could allow that by right, a tiny house as accessory dwelling by right, or more importantly on the state and national level, just putting together policies like Andrew was mentioning that are anti-discrimination, which one more fun fact here, um, Washington State just passed a state bill and the um, American Tiny House Association leader who is part of that, Todd McPhillips is sitting right here and in the green. Way to go, Tom. So, but Todd, sorry. Um, what's so cool about that bill is it has that discrimination. Well, that's not gonna solve the problem, but it says on a statewide level, we want acceptance. You can't discriminate against the tiny house use or placement in a way that you wouldn't a traditional home. So I have a, a dis I, I, I support the um, accessory dwelling units, but I, I also support on wheels as being able to buy your own land and put your tiny house there without you. I myself had uh, got my tiny home, followed the instructions. They told me I needed to get this permit, that permit, and moved in, moved my tiny house, set it up, and was getting ready to move into it where someone, an inspector lived in the same neighborhood, decided she was going to come and investigate. And because they have accessory dwelling units, how they're set, for one, is it, it is on another piece of land and you are basically like a guest house on that piece of land. But you still have to be in a res multi-residential code. You still have to go through um, you know, some barriers that still may get your tiny house moved where you have one piece of land, say you found a small piece of land where you want to put two or three or just yourself, not only do you bring up your property value, because maybe you want to sell that one day, you know? You may not can find someone, you look at that tiny house over there, it's a big tiny house where you can put that in um, into that area. But again, we're also talking about your property value long term when you're talking about tiny homes. And if we keep, you know, if we, and I don't disagree with that, I think a start is a start. But tiny homes don't lose their values like RVs and cars do. They, they're built in a residential standard with mobility. So we want to make sure that we also keep that marketable value because when cities feel you're marketable, then you're also able to build more, have more zoning geared to you. And sometimes we may just want to have our own little communities where we're not in the back of someone's yard. Right. Yeah. And I, I, I support you, you know, on that. Like, amen, and I would say that <laughs> a backyard or a farm, just any property with a primary dwelling, it doesn't, it, it lends itself to community, which I think is really important, mm -hmm. without the prohibitive cost of buying land. Because if you buy your own land, I think personally it makes a lot of sense on a community development like Elizabeth's doing, where you can share costs. But for most people, that is not in the budget because the land, you have infrastructure costs you have to be in charge of, and that can go to like cost way more than your tiny house. So for a personal house, I don't see it as feasible for a lot of people, but I agree it should be allowed. And I think Elizabeth mentioned something really awesome earlier, which is infill. Every city owns odd-shaped, unbuildable lots that you can activate and add value to right now by putting a movable structure there. And because of some of the green technologies that Elizabeth was mentioning, if that city's infrastructure is overloaded, you could take the edge off by relying on those other kinds of technologies. So interesting thing to be explored. And one more note, that those two um, pocket neighborhoods of movable houses I mentioned earlier, um, they're both being built on vacant lots that were just wasting away in mixed use neighborhoods. And now they're creating these beautiful landscaping plans, um, placing tiny homes in a way that's attractive, sustainable, and attainable, maybe versus affordable. You know, we can split hairs on what affordable versus attainable means. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, for my part, I, I really do think there is a real discussion that should be had to say, hey, you know, we believe in freedom in this country and we know that there's limitations to that freedom when it encroaches on other people's freedoms, right? But is there a, a world in which you could purchase a property and then move on to the property in the home that you deem appropriate for yourself? And is it appropriate for our, our policymakers to make stipulations based on if that's got wheels or not? Is that, a, you know, I think there's a very legitimate conversation that we're not going to completely have time to get into right now because it's very depth and we're going to want to open this up to conversation and questions. Um, but I will just put out there as an advocate myself in terms of, well, how are, how are we going to have the most effect with this product? Tiny homes, in my mind, is being this, this product that's being developed to fill the solutions that are out there for people desperate. And how do we're going to have the most effect? Well, most of our cities are already built out, right? We don't have a whole lot of vacant property. We do have some vacant property, and, and it's really great with small homes. You can fill smaller lots in a way that still is appropriate. Um, but if we really want to have the most amount of property, we do need to look at how we're going to increase density in the cities that ha are experiencing housing crisis and how we, in in um, how we increase that density in a way that still maintains harmony in the communities. So that, in my mind, brings us into why thinking about it and talking about tiny homes as accessory dwelling units is going to allow us to have potentially the largest impact and the potentially the largest amount of implement implementation of this process. Um, but absolutely, you should be able to, in my mind, buy a piece of property and put a tiny house on it. And as an American, I think that's called freedom. Well, Anyways, I mean, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, well, technically, you and I, we were all talking about this earlier. There's you're not technically allowed to live in an RV on wheels, right? It's not, you can't get a certificate of occupancy. You can't get the government's blessings on, yes, you can call this your permanent dwelling. Yet, nine to 10 million people already live like that. You That's know, right. and a lot of them living in fear of, uh, you know, am I gonna get kicked out of my backyard host? Am I gonna get caught here? Do I have to keep an address at my parents' place so I can get my mail and have a driver's license? Yep. You exactly. know, no say do it illegally. Yeah, we don't okay. want to live that way. Yep. So, yeah, and, and homelessness yeah. costs our country quite a bit, oh, gosh. right? B between policing and excess medical services and then the services around shelters and everything, you yeah. know, we are subsidizing right. people's ability to be homeless. Yeah. And whether we could use that money in a more constructive fashion to make people actually turn them into, instead of drains on society, net positive is, is definitely uh, the direction that I like to think about it. So we're running out of time, so we got to open up to questions for everybody. This is just questions, but I want to address what you said right there, because you came back to it, and it's the owner occupancy requirement for accessory dwelling units. Does everybody understand what that means? That means that there's typically, if you're going to build a accessory dwelling unit and rent it out, you have to live, the owner has to live in the home, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that's a protection to keep it from just turning into this yeah. tool for developers to cash in. And I'm back, I completely back you with that. I think when we move through to making, instigating policies, we do need to make sure that those policies are serving the people that need to be served and not just turning into another economic tool. Thank you, sir. Hi, I'm Rob Pallas, and uh, just an interested citizen. And my question is, say you have an infill lot in a city, and you decide, say, we can put four or five of these tiny dwellings on that property. And at some point, like, who owns the land in that situation? Is the city ultimately the landlord? Um, obviously, that property is going to have to belong to somebody, or does it get divvied up and sold to the people who are actually occupying the houses? So a lot of times what you see with city-owned properties, they typically don't just give it to you. They may send out an RFP or they may say you have to purchase it for, for sale. Uh, now you can do projects with them where the city needs so much housing. And again, most of them I've seen come out with a RFP, which is a request for, for a proposal. So um, let's just say maybe a 100-year lease with you. Um, they, they typically will do some type of co-op 
um, in the owning the you may own the home but you don't own the land so in those lease states um, if you were to purchase the property and and you can parcel it out but typically when it's such a small property what we see is more of a hundred year leases or some type of co-op uh, group that comes out of that where you own the home but you don't own the land which would lend itself perfectly for a situation that would work with a movable tiny house absolutely if I'm gonna buy a home but I have to put it on a property that I can't own I want to be able to take that thing with me right yeah, yeah. So, and okay. there, the two examples that I pointed out earlier are in Texas and Colorado that are using a vac vacant lots um, for infill. One is owned by a developer and he's selling the lot and the house, however small, to the people who are moving into the community. And the other one is like Elizabeth pointed out, which is a lot lease situation, which to Andrew's point is makes sense for a movable home. Oh yes. Um, hi. Thank you for the discussion. It's very interesting. Um, I have a question here. So, if you have a lot of land, uh, you know, a lot of land, could it be like? So, my definition of tiny home would be an apartment, a studio apartment that would be smartly designed that can serve as a one-bedroom apartment like that. So, would you think it's better to build like story, like you know, four or five levels, and then you have like multiple units like that, and that will serve the needs of more people rather than like more mobile tiny homes and because I thought about it for like CT like DC or San Francisco it's really hard to find a place to park a tiny home um, so what do you think about that? I I personally, real quick, I think that, yeah, for big cities, tiny homes on wheels are tiny homes that are, it doesn't really make sense because it's not about having a lot of space, it's about how you can build up. But just like what you said, the same tenants and concepts that we use to construct tiny homes in a highly efficient fashion absolutely apply to small apartments. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think none of us try to, like, delineate the differential. It's about creating a space that works for somebody and creates pride in them. So my state is now working with us. They want us to help them push for some tiny, what they call tiny house apartments, which is basically a studio apartment because they went away from that to build more luxury because they made it harder for people to build affordable housing. So now they're going back to that minimum. How can we have the most density of smaller unit apartments and call it tiny apartments or whatever they want to call it. It's just studios or one bedroom apartments because they don't we, our density is going up and we want it to go up and to use as much on our property. So it's the same concept. We are, one thing about tiny houses is just not living small. It's actually a lifestyle choice as well yes. to, live sim yes. to live simple, to, to, to appreciate everything Experience we have life. and to decrease and downsize ourselves. Yeah, and you know, something that, that Zach um, Matt mentioned to me a couple years ago, um, a term that I told him I would rob from him gladly, was is, it's got to be housing with dignity. Um, it can't be just shoving people in a box. You know, where it's got to be a, it's got to feel like a nice box. You know, if you're going to put somebody in a small space, it's got to fit them. And that's where, that's where all the customization stuff, that's where all the cool little gadgets and storage places come from in the tiny house movement is people customizing these surroundings that you're living in to fit them perfectly, right? And uh, I think that that's a real important thing rather than stack a bunch of boxes. You know, as soon as you mention that, I, I, I picture much just a cube squares, you know, Minecraft, if you will, pop, popped up and I was like, well, we're going to have to put a balcony on each one and they're going to have to have a little flower garden and it's going to have to barbecue grill and, and blah, blah, yeah. blah. It's got to be something people can be proud of. And, and I also would just say to add to that, when you're building apartment buildings with a mentality of tiny houses, right, you also have to think about the conversation that we had about um, communities right. and what makes a what makes a community a community and and how that can be jeopardized when things get too big and then you don't feel like you're a part of anything right with an apartment building that's very easy to happen right that's people right. are neighbors but you don't really interact with them I would say that there's a lot of room in design of our apartment buildings to facilitate some of the same concepts we're using in the tiny home village to create this naturally occurring um, interaction between human beings Beings yeah. and, and facilitate the socialization. That's such a great point, Zach, and there actually are co-housing examples of that where it, they're basically apartment buildings but with common spaces, and so there's a lot to learn from that. Oh, yeah. But um, yeah. I think you raise a good point. Every place is different, but the more solutions, the merrier, and so what fits that piece of lot 
that piece of land the best, um, and that should be what's explored. But again, every city, small, maybe less so for large, but small and medium-sized cities have these weird little lots that could easily be yeah. activated with tiny homes in a way that creates something beautiful outside of just staff boxes. All right, we got time for one last question. You haven't addressed the issue of sewer, water, and trash. So well, those are the three areas that are run into with each one of the uh, communities that we deal with, is sewer, water, and trash, and how you're going to address that on the, on the front end and how that's going to impact their infrastructure and how, how that's all going to be handled. So sewer, water, and trash are three things that you haven't addressed. Are, are you uh, talking your, about as in a community like on wheels or community, on foundation? Community, individual, yeah. home, place on a property, something similar. There so still has to be sewer, water, and trash. Even if you're using a composting toilet, you still have the issue of gray water and so on and so forth. So who, when you build a home, you, you know, there's standard codes of how you're going to build that, that your site plan, your, your site development. So if you're going to build a tiny house, say, you know, on your own piece of land, um, for one, if you choose to have a gray water system, if you choose to have a composting toilet, um, there are some regulations that go with that. And so how to address it is I have to follow by what my code standards are. And it's also I have to go by what I feel I want. Because I have people who say, I want everything sustainable and off the grid except my toilet. I need to have it hooked up to the city because I don't want to see my waste. You understand? <laughs> so it's up to you. It's your choice on how that goes. We don't really, I mean, it's if I go put a house on a piece of land, it's what that zoning codes require or what I desire and how I'm going to make that happen. And, and I'll do a really quick example of like, okay, if it's an ADU, you're going to either be off the grid or you're going to be tied into the into the utility. So the it's electric, it's goes. septic, and then trash is going to go and get dealt with the same way. If you're in a community, you're going to, depending if you can, you can tie into the, to the sewer system and you can tie into that and you can just have flush to toilets. If you're in a community and you are doing composting toilets, everything gets a lot more simple. Yeah. Because composting toilets, to do it right, require a couple different stations. Yep. Mm -hmm. And to do it in as one person in one, with one person person's waste is um, it's not as efficient as, as compi compiling it all together. Um, and so what he's saying is if we all get our crap together, <laughs> we can make this stuff work. Yeah. And then yeah, and then and then there's always the off-grid option and I'll let you talk about that and then we're gonna have to go because we're already off. Okay, so to, to address part of that issue is um, and this we actually brought an example of how we can address that. Our house over there is completely running on its own power. It actually has enough excess power to plug two more houses into it if you wanted today because it's nice and sunny. It also does not require a sewage hookup. It has an incinerator toilet and this is why we're here this is the innovative housing showcase right yeah. so we're showing some innovative ideas um, our house alone would take the, the strain off of the um, fossil fuel electricity being produced because we don't need it takes a strain off of the black water sewage system we don't need it um, and as far as gray water um, we actually have systems for recycling that that you can run it through there and bring out perfectly surgically clean water we can and do water collection water treatment um, and as far as like a water source um, you can do a well on my property I have wells or you can tie in if it's required to by the city if you have if you're required um, so so yeah it, yeah so and, and I think it really comes down to attainability and uh, the uh, ability for more people to utilize that tool if you can have an off-grid home and you want to move as an accessory dwelling unit well if you don't have to extend the utilities there's a big expense upfront expense that you don't have to actually engage in and that's going to be mean more property owners get to just say yes to it without dropping a big investment into that decision they can say yes you can move back if you mow, mow the lawn and you know maybe yeah. help me with the roof you can move back there right. take, you know so it provides an ability for more people to say yes right and I guys I think that that I is going to do it I would love to extend this yeah. for that much longer put it up for our distinguished guests here Andrew Bennett and Elizabeth Singleton, <laughs> and Alexis Stevens. No, no, not for me. <laughs> no, for her awesome partner over there, Christian. Hey, Stevens. Christian. Hardworking individual. All right.
If it wasn't filmed, it didn't happen. Thank you guys so much for and coming. Thank you, HUD. Right. Yes. Thank you, HUD. Hey guys, Alexis and Christian here with Tiny House Expedition. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And click left or right for more Tiny House stories and tours.